It all started with a problem, one that couldn't be ignored. The deeper miners dug into the earth in the early 18th century, the more they found themselves fighting a rising tide. Not of competition, but of water. Flooded mines weren't just a nuisance, they were death traps, threatening lives, livelihoods and the growing hunger for coal that fueled Britain's budding industries. Back then, coal wasn't just another commodity, it was power. It heated homes, smelted iron and fed the fires of everything from breweries to brickyards. But with coal deposits buried deeper than ever, water was halting progress and the tools available to fight it woefully inadequate. Horse-driven pumps were slow, expensive and prone to failure. Something better was needed. Uh, but let's rewind for a moment, because before Thomas Newcomen would create the first practical steam engine, there were two men, separated by geography, united by obsession. The first was Denis Papin, a brilliant French physicist born in 1647. Papin was fascinated by pressure. He tinkered endlessly with early ideas about how steam could be harnessed to move pistons. In 1690, he built a model of a steam-powered piston engine, a sort of pressure cooker with ambition. He even imagined using steam to propel boats. But the technology of the time, and perhaps his own resources, weren't ready. His ideas stayed mostly theoretical. Then came Thomas Savory, an English military engineer who, in 1698, patented a device with a bold title, a new invention for raising water by fire. Savory's engine used steam to create a vacuum and draw water upward through suction. It worked in principle and even attracted some investment, but there was a fatal flaw. The machine had no piston, instead it relied on steam pressure alone, and when that pressure got too high, well, let's just say it occasionally turned into a bomb. Explosions were frequent, it was also limited in how deep it could pump. Savory's design wasn't scalable and it wasn't safe. And yet these early missteps weren't failures, they were stepping stones. Because in 1712, a modest blacksmith from Devon named Thomas Newcomen combined the ideas of both Papin and Savory and did something no one else had. He made it work. In the coal fields of Staffordshire, Newcomen unveiled a towering, creaking, steam-powered device unlike anything seen before. Using steam to fill a vertical cylinder and then rapidly cooling it with a spray of water, he created a vacuum that pulled down a piston with astonishing force. That motion, linked to a pivoting beam, drove a pump rod deep underground, hauling water out stroke by stroke. It was massive, loud, ugly even, but it worked reliably, safely, and that made it revolutionary. This was the world's first practical steam engine, and it was immediately put to work at the Coney Gree Coal Works near Dudley. Soon, engines like it began sprouting across England, particularly in Cornwall, where deep tin and copper mines had long been plagued by flooding. The genius of Newcomen's design lay not just in what it did, but in what it didn't require. No explosives, no high-pressure dangers, just atmospheric pressure doing the heavy lifting. By the mid-18th century, over a hundred Newcomen engines were in operation, some of them running non-stop for decades. They weren't efficient, but they were effective. And for coal mines sitting on endless fuel, efficiency wasn't the priority. It was about survival and scale. Still, some minds looked at Newcomen's creation and saw not the end of a journey, but the beginning. One of those mines was a young Scottish instrument maker named James Watt. In 1763, Watt was asked to repair a small model of a Newcomen engine at the University of Glasgow. As he studied the mechanism, he noticed something that had gone largely unchallenged. The engine wasted an enormous amount of energy reheating the same cylinder over and over again. Watt became obsessed, and in 1765 he made a breakthrough, the separate condenser. 
Instead of cooling and heating the main cylinder constantly, Watt's design directed the steam into a separate cold chamber where it would condense. The main cylinder stayed hot. Efficiency soared. He didn't stop there. Over time, Watt developed engines with double-acting pistons which pushed and pulled. He added rotary motion, making it possible to drive spinning machinery. And in partnership with the entrepreneurial Matthew Bolton, Watt turned his invention into a business. Bolton and Watt's engine wasn't just a better pump. It was a powerhouse for textile mills, iron forges, grain mills and more. Industries that once relied on rivers and streams could now operate anywhere. Steam had broken the chains of geography. It wasn't long before others tried to capitalize on the momentum. Engineers like Jonathan Hornblower and Richard Trevithick experimented with higher pressure engines and compound systems. But Watt was fiercely protective of his patents. Some rivals found themselves tangled in court rather than caught up in progress. The so-called engine wars of the late 1700s were as much about legal maneuvering as they were about engineering. And yet innovation couldn't be caged forever. By the early 1800s, steam engines were no longer just tools for pumping. They were driving entire factories, powering ships, and soon would become the muscle behind locomotives. Steam, once a dangerous byproduct, had become the beating heart of an empire. The economic effects were staggering. Productivity multiplied. The cost of goods dropped. Labor became more specialized. Entire industries exploded. Cities like Manchester, Leeds and Glasgow grew from market towns into industrial giants and Britain, it became the workshop of the world. But progress came with a price. The same steam engines that lifted prosperity also widened inequality. Factory workers toiled in gruelling conditions, often for 14 or 16 hours a day. Children operated heavy machinery, pollution darkened skies, rivers turned black with waste. And the countryside, once quiet and pastoral, echoed with the relentless rhythm of progress. And yet, none of it could be undone. Because the steam engine had not just changed the economy, it had changed expectation. People now believed that problems could be solved by invention, that power could be harnessed, and that nature itself could be bent to human will. From Papin's sketches to Savory's clumsy pump, from Newcomen's piston thump to Watt's elegant refinements, the steam engine wasn't just a machine, it was a moment, a turning point, a signal to the world that the rules had changed. No longer did we wait for wind or water. Now, with coal and cleverness, we could create our own force, our own fire, our own future. It's easy to forget, in a world of smartphones and satellites, that our age of electricity and automation was born from a simple idea, boil water, move a piston. And it all traces back to a humble question asked in a flooded mine. Isn't there a better way? That question and the answers it sparked ignited the modern world. And that is a eureka moment.